I received some very nice and much appreciated feedback from many of you about the sermon from last Sunday and in talking about what it was that you appreciated about it most of you said something along the lines of the the personal story that kind of anchored the biblical text and helped you to relate to the text as well as to your pastor which is always a good thing too now today's story about Paul and Silas in jail I don't have a story for that because I've never been in jail so I don't have as many interesting anecdotes or a personal tale so what I had to do is I had to think who is a jailer that we all know and can identify with that we all know and love who is that person that I could use as a sermon illustration that would without hesitation draw you into a connection to this story as well and so I came up with this moment please take a listen <laughs> Yeah, that's probably one of our most beloved jailers. And there are some parallels to this scene from the Andy Griffith show, where two people escape and it's the jailer that's worried for his job in life and starts running around. Now, I don't think that the jailer in the Book of Acts was quite as uh, comical as Barney, but uh, the fear of being embarrassed or fired, I think, was very, very real. Now, the other thing where this is different than the text this morning is that the prisoners in this story on the Andy Griffith show were eager to escape. In fact, they manipulated their own escape, pulling one over on Barney. But as is always the case, Andy's always there to, to save Barney's honor and to uh, kind of keep things from going too far sideways, as it, as it were. As our story opens up in this 16th chapter of the book of Acts, Paul and Silas, and as we understand the gospel writer of Luke and Acts, is present amongst a group of believers that are that are hanging out and and trying to teach people and to love people into the kingdom of god to share with them the good news of of christ we know full well that there are some secular romans there uh, that's some of the charges that are that are brought up against paul and silas and in essence all that happens is paul makes a young girl stop talking through the demon that has possessed her now artists have have done some things over the years to try and figure out who she was but she was a slave girl and she was from um, possibly some kind of tribal culture that uh, willingly opens oneself up to to demons so that they can have a deeper sense of power and knowledge that seems so secret that it's a power that can be that can be held and so however it was that she found herself possessed more than likely by no effort or will of her own because she was owned by someone who used her to make money. But as Paul and Silas and the, the disciples of Jesus were walking down the street, she came in and fell in with them and started proclaiming the truth of why they were there. These people are going to tell you about God. They're slaves to God. They're going to tell you about salvation. And then immediately Luke writes, and Paul was annoyed. So he sent the demon packing. <laughs> that's, that's Matthew's translation. He, he gets annoyed. It says annoyed in the NRSV. He is annoyed. Now, the Greek in that is a little more complex. So it's Paul is, Paul's had it. Paul is being tormented. It's more than just the kid kicking the back of your seat when you're on a long road trip screaming, are we there yet? Can I have a drink of water? Are we there yet? Kicking, kicking, kicking. And you get so annoyed. No! No, Paul has got some kind of spiritual torment going on, too. And so he, he cast the demon out, and that very hour it, it goes. Now, it is discovered that when that demon comes out, of course, this girl loses all of her power, and she is now ruined. So the man that owns her brings Paul and Silas up on charges, has them drug into the, the city square, and says, hey, these guys cost me money. They're bringing a different kind of thing here that was illegal for them to even be saying. So I think we ought to just take care of it. And so they're arrested. And they're not just arrested. They go through a very similar situation that Jesus went through when he was arrested. Now, it's only a small version of what Jesus went through. And they weren't beaten with the cat of nine tails, which was the large... Uh, leather bound 
um, striking implement that had the, the long leather cords with bits of shrapnel and bone tied on the ends so that when it was swung at Jesus, it ripped his back open. They were still beaten within an inch of their life. Basically, they were caned. They were beaten with sticks, rods. And then they were put not just into the prison, but they were put into the, the, the room that didn't really have any outside walls connected, in the center of the, the prison. And then these large wooden timbers that, who knows if they were the right size or not, but they had holes cut in. So you'd sit down and you'd put your legs on top of the timbers in the grooves, and then they'd take other timbers that had the same grooves upside down and put them down so that the top timber locked the bottom timber around your ankles so that you could not get out. And then you were chained. So you couldn't even just go into a locked cell crawl into a smelly corner and sleep. You, you had to sit locked in place or lay back and lean your head against the wall. So they did the will of Jesus. They saved a little girl or a young woman. They were arrested for it. And then they found themselves in prison. And instead of trying to figure out a way to connive the jailer like these gentlemen did to Barney Fife. They just simply seemed to accept their circumstance. They accepted their circumstance when they were arrested, they accepted their circumstance when they were beaten, and they accepted their circumstance when they were in prison. They knew that they had done nothing wrong, yet they just sat there. And then right about midnight, Luke tells us, right about midnight, which is what? The change of a new day. You see, God always does miraculous things at midnight. God brings about change at midnight. Legend holds that that's the moment that Christ was resurrected, was at midnight, early, early, early Sunday morning. And so they begin singing and praying. And I don't think that they were the kind of songs we would expect, like, Oh God, there are walls, can you please break them down? You know, it's not those kinds of songs, which you and I would probably like to sing. Oh Lord, did I do anything wrong? Can you uh, get us out of here? So there was something about Paul's attitude and Silas's attitude that is meant for us to, to learn. And this poor woman, she was freed. She was imprisoned, not just in her servanthood to that horrible man that made money off of her demon possession, but she was possessed by a demon and was given no will of her own. That's a prison. She was chained to that identity as a divinator or a divine seer, sideshow trick that would make money for her master, and she would, she would be freed. Not from his possession, but she would be freed from the darkness that had a hold on her in the name of Jesus. She was freed. It's kind of hard to see, but this is the, uh, the jail cell as depicted by an artist. And there's more people in there. More than likely, there wasn't a whole lot of people in the cell with Paul and Silas because they were in that special central cell. But what I like about what the artist has done here is it's really highlighted this centurion this this jailer and he is really terrified because if you can see real see the bars on the gate into the cell have been completely bent all you have to do is push on it and you you can escape and over here somewhere there's paul and there's silas and they're just singing and praying and everyone's just listening trying to figure out what has just happened so the jailer rushes to the the cell and he takes his sword out, not so that he can corral the prisoners. He assumes they're already gone. He's going to take his own life because he thinks whatever he does to himself to die is going to be way more merciful than what the government officials are going to do to him for letting the prisoners escape. Most importantly, Paul and Silas. Paul calls out in a strong voice, yells out, Luke says. He yells out, hey, don't worry about it. We're still here. Again, Matthew's translation. Don't worry about it. 
We didn't escape. We're still here. He's like, what? The prison doors opened and you didn't just walk out? No. What is it within someone such as Paul that the doors to the prison miraculously open and you still stay inside? You still stay in prison. Maybe that's the point for us. You see, we, we sometimes bounce from prison to prison to prison, and we are constantly identifying ourselves with what oppresses us or what is challenging us or what wounds us or what hurts us. And these are all things that should be important to us, but they should never define us, and they should never make us feel as though there is no hope and there is no possibility of change in our life. Something such as depression or addiction, those sorts of things need to be clinically treated. Those are important things to be dealt with. But a state of mind can be a prison, too, to think that we can never achieve more in our life. We can never love more or be loved more in our life. And we can just sit down in the stocks and allow the darkness to creep in and define us with a sense of overwhelming hopelessness. But then there's Paul who teaches us something different. So we can be like Paul or we can be like the guy who was uh, in the county jail and he noticed that there were some, some loose cinder blocks in his cell and if he wiggled them just right with the edge of a spoon that he managed to find under his bunk, apparently there was no shakedown in the county jail either. And so he, he, he found a way to kind of work those out, and he got just enough of them loose that he could crawl through and then pull the stones shut behind him. And he, and he tunneled and worked and tunneled and worked, and he finally got to the point where he knew he would come up in the courtyard where the delivery trucks would come and go, a laundry truck or a food service truck. And they were big enough that he could come up underneath one of the manhole covers and climb into the the framework underneath the undercarriage of the truck. And so he did that. One night at dusk when the last truck was getting ready to leave, he went in, he crawled out. Underneath the truck, no one could see him. He shut the manhole cover back and he climbed into the truck and, and held tight, burning himself on the muffler and moving over so he could have a good spot where he wouldn't get hurt. And finally, it happened. The truck began to move. And he kind of counted in his head about how far they were going and and finally, they made it through the gate. The truck didn't even stop. They had the gate open so they could get it shut for the night. And they drove, and they drove, and they drove. And, and finally, the, the truck stopped. He figured maybe it was some outskirt gas station or something. And he, he knew he could, uh, as the, he could see the darkness had started kind of creeping through. The, the, the nighttime had come. And so he quickly dropped down and scampered out from underneath the truck. Almost instantly, after about three steps had been taken, large light shone down upon him, and the sound of really large barking dogs started coming closer and closer and closer. And it was at that moment he realized he had successfully escaped the county jail only to break into the state prison. <laughs> and isn't that the way it is with us? Don't we try and try to do so many things on our own and escape our circumstance and escape maybe the way that we feel about things and we treat how we feel with things that are not Christ? Blaise Pascal famously said that we are all born with a God-sized hole in our being and, and we spend our entire lives trying to fill it with as many things as we can, but the only thing that will ever truly seal it is Christ himself. And we just go from one situation to another trying to escape. We're, we're constantly thinking about escaping, escaping. Let's get out of this prison. Let's escape. Let's escape. You see why Paul didn't try to escape that jail with Silas? was because Paul saw himself, identified himself as already free. Paul was already free. Whether he was in the marketplace, whether he was in prison, whether he was walking on the road, Paul, because of Jesus Christ, was all, already free. And later he would write in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, 
For though I am free with respect to all, I have made myself a slave to all, that I might win more of them. He stayed as a slave in the prison to save the jailer. Maybe he knew he was going to do that. Maybe God spoke into his heart quietly, and he just said, you know, just stay here. Later in that same kind of section, he says, I have become all things to all people that I might by all means save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel so that I may share in the blessings. He's not willing to do without the goodness of Jesus and the blessings of Jesus. He just knows that the greatest things are still yet to come. And he knows that if we live a life where we already claim the freedom of Christ, all the other things are things that we can endure especially if we have each other to go through it together. Especially if we are, as he wrote in Galatians, bearers of one another's burdens. If we all self-identify as free, what does that do to the fear of change? What does that do to the fear of what's next? Nothing. Because nothing can separate us from the love of God through Jesus Christ. And that night they sat down in a jailer's home, and it says, and he brought before them food. And the Greek word for food is the same word that's used for table. He included them in his family. He welcomed them to the table, and in the table they welcomed him into the family of God. And yet another biblical example of the table unifying everyone in the name of Christ. So how is it with your soul this morning? Who do you identify with the the most? Do you identify with Barney? Trying so hard to keep it together, have a brave face, and no matter what, stuff just keeps falling apart. You know what? It's okay, because even if you're Barney, you're free. Or maybe you're still like the prisoners in the the, the county jail or in the Andy Griffith show, and you're still trying to connive your way out of your situation. You're so focused on how to get out, you don't really know where you're at. You're just never happy with where you're at. You know what, if that's who you think you are, then I've got great news for you. You're free too. You don't have to behave that way anymore. Or maybe you're in a place in your life where you're starting to feel more like Paul. That things are going to come that are good and things are going to come that are bad. But no matter what, you are free in Christ. And so my challenge for you is to, first off, to claim that and celebrate that. But to live life in such a way that you inspire that same attitude in others. That... You know what? No matter what comes, you're not going to be alone. We'll walk together. So what is the place of freedom? It's wherever you're at with Jesus. It's wherever you're at with Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.